We're going to get started, and it's my, it's my duty to introduce Jonathan, but it seems like you already know everybody here, so I'm not sure. <laughs> right, for the, those two people, um, Jonathan, he comes to us from across the street where he wears many hats, it looks like. He's in the dental school, the School of Medicine, and the School of Engineering, and also directs the, what is it called, the uh, Center for Integrated Tissue Engineering, um, where he works with his bioengineering and his skin equivalents, um, with the goal to use these cells to personalize therapies for regeneration or repair of damaged or diseased tissues. But something that m many of you may not know about is that Jonathan is a rap rapper. And I looked him up on YouTube. He's got like 50,000 hits on one of his raps. So I really... <laughs> So that, that's really will help. Um, it's a translational work of science to the art and to the communication. So um, I look forward to your talk. Okay, and thanks. so. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Liz. And it's great, great to be here, uh, not only because I have so many collaborators in the audience, but because this is probably uh, the most collaborative research environment that I know of at Tufts. And that's really thanks to Samin and her vision, uh, providing the opportunity to create clusters highly collaborative, highly interactive. And I hope that uh, after my talk today, we'll be able to stimulate some more of those collaborations, even as I look out into the audience and see some of my existing collaborators. Uh, I'm gonna take you on a little tour today, uh, taking you to three different worlds that I'll tell you about in a moment. But I had a, actually a stark reminder yesterday of the value of uh, uh, aging research as I ventured uh, out to play softball for the first time in about 10 years and quickly learned that uh, aging is real. And if you see me moving around uh, up here on the podium, wincing, please, anytime I wince, take that as a signal that there is more work to be done. So I offer that in the spirit of, uh, of collaboration. So this little slide reminds us that what we do, and some of you may be familiar with this work of Van Gogh at all published last century. You can see here the beautiful overlap between our cultures of induced pluripotent stem cells, clusters of these cells that I'll describe to you in a few moments, surrounded by a feeder layer of supportive mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And this work really requires both an understanding of science, but more important, an understanding of artistry. So I think it's a relevant reminder that what we do sometimes is really poised right at the interface between uh, science and the arts. So I'm going to take you on this little tour today of three, three different worlds. Uh, the first world is the world of pluripotent stem cells and try to give you a sense of their remarkable versatility and what they might have to offer uh, the world of regenerative therapies and beyond. Secondly, I want to take you on a guided tour of uh, three-dimensional tissue biology and how we can create complex tissues in the laboratory that provide us with an opportunity to view biology in what we call the third dimension and to ask questions that you cannot ask by plating cells on plastic, as great as plastic is. And finally, the last thing I'm going to tell you is how we bring these two worlds together to think about treating complex chronic diseases in an aging population. And I'll tell you about some of our work looking at uh, diabetic foot ulcers as a therapeutic target in which we can use induced pluripotent stem cells derived from that disease condition and three-dimensional tissues in order to fully understand the functionality of those cells. And I'll leave you hopefully with a message that will allow us to think about other chronic diseases, other diseases of the aging, of the aged, that uh, can use and leverage the best of both induced pluripotent stem cell biology and the best of three-dimensional tissue biology. So of course, it's no surprise to you, uh, by now you know that induced pluripotent stem cells received the Nobel Prize uh, this year, the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Shinya Yamanaka's great discovery of being able to reprogram adult cells back to a pluripotent state. But he was awarded this Nobel Prize together with John Gurdon, 
for his work essentially on reprogramming cells through a technology called somatic cell nuclear transfer. That was an observation that he made 40 years ago. So it's really interesting. Most uh, Nobel Prizes in medicine are awarded for uh, technologies that have already been reduced to practice or helping people in the clinic. And interestingly, uh, I asked the question, what is the path forward uh, for induced pluripotent stem cells to treat human disease? And uh, I will hopefully show you that there is a way to bridge this gap going from this discovery to engineered tissues as an important step in finding ways to uh, best leverage this incredible technology for human therapy. So this is a 40-year uh, period of discovery rewarded by a Nobel Prize, and I will now tell you a little bit about these induced pluripotent stem cells, what their biological relevance is, and how we think about leveraging them for future therapies. One of the take-home messages that I want to provide you with today, and there are many papers, actually I brought one along to talk to the students about later, there are many recent papers that show when you take a cell and reprogram it back to an induced pluripotent stem cell and then differentiate it back to a specific cell type, and I'll explain to you in a moment how that's done, it appears that you can rejuvenate, recalibrate, almost reboot the cell of origin, your donor cell, and improve its mitochondrial function to allow the output cell to evade replicative senescence, to improve its response to oxidative stress. I'll show you some data where we've found that you can actually improve the ability of these cells that we derive to produce extracellular matrix. So I think it really raises an intriguing question for those of you interested in studying aging. Do we have a tool here, a technology, that can allow us to reverse the aging process in a dramatic way? And when I say dramatic way, I mean in a way that has a therapeutic, potential therapeutic impact. So I'm going to talk to you about this conceptualization today and how we think about possibly treating diabetic foot ulcers using this uh, idea of recalibrating a cell to improve its biological potency. And in a way, to take a complex, uh, to take a cell that's derived from a complex, chronic disease environment and to somehow reverse, reprogram, and recalibrate its biological potential. Because if we can do that, and if we can make skin that has cells that now have improved functionality after reprogramming, we can think about doing great things for regenerative therapies as well as disease modeling in our tissues. So the story that I'm going to tell you about at the very end, after I talk to you about induced pluripotent stem cells and talk to you about uh, 3D tissue biology, is conceptualizing how we might repair and heal chronic wounds that quite often, in fact, 40 to 50 percent of the cases, are recalcitrant to human therapies. So this is the therapeutic challenge. This is the starting point from where we're thinking about applying these IPS-based technologies now. And I will walk you down the path of thinking about how this might be a therapeutic disease target to actually reverse cells taken from a non-healing wound environment, reprogram them back to an IPS, differentiate them again to a fibroblast, but hopefully into a fibroblast that has an improved functionality. And the way I want to present this is I'm hoping that you will all think of your cells of interest and your chronic diseases that you hope to target, many of them associated with an aging process, many of them associated with replicative senescence, and somehow find a way to tweak these cells and optimize them in ways that will allow them to be uh, beneficially re uh, re transplanted back into this environment for human uh, healing and therapy. So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, an introduction to induced pluripotent stem cells and their counterparts, human embryonic stem cells. Uh, as a human embryonic stem cell researcher funded by the NIH, uh, my lab is uh, susceptible to decisions made at the political level, made at the governmental level, and made at the level of uh, district court judges in the District of Columbia. And I would have to say it was very, very providential almost that at the same time that there was a government uh, decision, or I should say a legal decision, to block the use of human embryonic stem cells 
uh, in uh, NIH-funded labs about three years ago. We had opportunities to develop, uh, in parallel, induced pluripotent stem, stem cells as an ethically uncontroversial uh, alternative. So I think it was a really good example of how uh, I needed to become very literate and very informed in uh, areas related to ethics, policy, law, uh, philosophy even, of uh, what, the, what the basis was for making these decisions. And as I'm mentioning this because I think it's really important for graduate students, postdocs, to be thinking broadly about the broader impacts of the science, uh, what our responsibilities are, as scientists in the community to be aware of these dynamic, controversial, and sometimes polarizing issues. So I'll start talking a little bit about embryonic stem cells because that's where we started doing our work, but I'll quickly transition into uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, which now represent uh, a very realistic alternative to uh, using uh, cells derived from human embryos. So here is the scheme, the general scheme, of where human embryonic stem cells are derived from a, uh, the blastocyst, the inner cell mass of a human embryo. And these cells are derived as an embryonic stem cell line and uh, eventually differentiated using a variety of protocols which are now very, very standard. I can tell you, you can pretty much direct uh, embryonic stem cells into any one of the uh, germ uh, lineages, into ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm, there are well-established protocols for doing that. That's really not a problem. And what happens is, as you direct cells into a differentiated phenotype, and I'll describe some of this work in a moment, you uh, restrict the biological potency, and you move towards a differentiated cell that has an improved cellular function. So essentially, you're trading off the loss of pluripotency, and pluripotency means that these cells have the capacity to give rise to any cell type from any one of those three germ layers, and you're restricting these cells more and more by differentiating them in an environment where we have a chemical signal as well as an attachment substrate that can specify both lineage fate as well as cell outcomes. So ultimately, the goal of differentiating embryonic stem cells is to acquire a cell that's functional, that's well characterized, and allows us to think about potentially using this for human therapy. So as I mentioned several years ago, uh, Yamanaka's group and then Jamie Thompson's group at the University of Wisconsin developed this groundbreaking technology to take a cell from an adult, isolate and harvest fibroblasts, or many other cell types for that matter, to transfer, at that time, the discovery was four genes into those cells to reprogram them back to a pluripotent state, and essentially they found that these cells were equivalent to the human embryonic stem cells that were uh, derived from a human embryo. These cells could then be differentiated. We already had a significant body of knowledge over the six to eight years before their discovery. We used a lot of the differentiation protocols that were available from what we understood about human embryonic stem cells. And these cells could be differentiated into a cell of choice and provide opportunities now for human cell therapies. But an even lower hanging fruit is, if you think about it, you now have an opportunity to have a patient-specific cell type differentiated into a particular cell lineage that you can use as a disease model to perhaps screen new therapeutics, to understand something about the pathogenesis of these diseases. And it's certainly an interesting and exciting opportunity that uh, I can mention a little bit more about towards the end. So here you have two distinct sources of pluripotent stem cells, many of which are able to generate uh, a variety of different cell types. Our cells of interest are human skin, uh, human skin fibroblasts in particular, but this is a really still a big question mark in the field. Are these two sources of cells equivalent? One that has perhaps a memory of the donor cell population from which they were derived and one of which does not have that baggage because these cells are the equivalent of what uh, a developing embryo into a fetus would have in its uh, pro biological program. And these cells, as it turns out, do have a uh, epigenetic memory of their previous lives. So it's still an open scientific question as to what the equivalence between these two cell types is. So I'm going to walk you through some of our early studies. 
where we first characterized the uh, biology of cells derived from embryonic stem cells, quickly showed that there was equivalence with cells that we could derive from induced pluripotent stem cells. And this next step of differentiation, we characterize the differentiation of these cells into human fibroblasts. So what I'm also going to tell you is that once we had these cells, there was a real question, how do we best characterize them and how do we best make sense out of what we, what we have? And when I say make sense, I really mean asking the question, what's the best way to characterize their paracrine features, angiogenic features, transcriptional features, and then to use three-dimensional tissues, actually take these cells, put them into the complex microenvironment of in vivo-like tissues to really understand their functionality. And I'll get back to that point in a few minutes, because many of us have looked on a plastic dish and say, we've got some nice mesenchymal cells here, cells with a mesenchymal morphology, but how would you really know what those cells are unless you had a complex microenvironment in which you could put those cells and really understand their functionality when they're placed into an environment that mimics what they would do in vivo. So I'll get back to that point after I show you a little bit more about the cell characterization. So these are some of our early experiments. They were published a couple of years ago by Carl Hewitt, my graduate student. And what we did was, what he did was, it was a lot of trial and error, but he was able to take these undifferentiated human embryonic stem cells, and here you see a colony of them here, and you see their cell-cell interactions. And by manipulating the chemical environment, by manipulating the cell surface, by adding different media, he was able to generate after 28 days some cells that had acquired this fibroblast morphology. You can see very spindled, very swirled. And what's interesting, you can start to see some of these cells emerging here. We did some uh, ex expression mapping early on, and we found that it seemed as if these cells were expressing some neuronal progenitors early on. So the thinking is that perhaps these are evolving through a neural crest uh, origin. But after 21 to 28 days, we started to see that these cells had acquired uh, phenotypic features, morphology, that was associated with human fibroblasts. Subsequent to that, we found that we could do exactly the same thing with induced pluripotent stem cells. So uh, we acquired induced pluripotent stem cells from a collaborator, differentiated them using this, exactly the same protocol. And you can see here by day 28, cells that we call IPDK cells are identical to EDK cells. And in fact, we started doing some mapping on these cells and what we found was that markers of pluripotency, namely OCT4 and NANOG, which are highly expressed both in the embryonic stem cell colonies as well as the induced pluripotent stem cell colonies, actually began to disappear with differentiation. And after, as you can see here, these are all our differentiated cells derived from induced pluripotent stem cells and embryonic stem cells. And they completely shut off expression of these pluripotency markers, very similar to what we see in our parental uh, human mature adult fibroblasts. In addition, as these cells differentiate into these specific lineages, not only are they losing markers of pluripotency, but here we can see that they're acquiring characteristic markers, collagen 1, PDF receptor beta, vimentin, thi1. They're acquiring markers that are specific to this particular lineage of interest, namely a fibroblast lineage. So they're losing, they don't have expression of these markers in a pluripotent state, and we can see that they are expressing markers of these specific lineages. So what's quite striking and remarkable about doing this is if you think about what people are doing within 28 days on a plastic dish, is that they're recapitulating some of these developmental stages of lineage commitment that are usually occurring uh, in a human embryo, uh, over the course of a much longer period of time, and the uh, specific lineages that can be generated at this point, pretty much almost any cell type that you can think of, there's a protocol for it right now, and it's pretty remarkable that within 28 days, you can shift cells using these chemical signals into uh, lineages that are typical and characteristic and quite similar to those seen in an adult. So, we then had to ask how similar is it to what we get from an adult, and we use some very uh, well-established uh, markers to characterize this. So, for example, our IPS-derived fibroblasts were compared to the parental cell line from which the IPS that they were derived from were reprogrammed. So this is the direct parental 
uh, lineage uh, donor for the IPS that these IPS-derived fibroblasts were generated from. If you remember that circle of life that I showed you before. And you can see that all of these markers of mesenchymal cell lineage, these cells are expressing at very, very high levels. And you can see that markers of uh, endothelial cells, uh, hematopoietic lineages, are not expressed either in the control fibroblasts or in the cells that we derive from these IPS or ES cells. So we thought, wow, that's really interesting. That's cool. What else can these cells do? How versatile are they? So we did some quick screens on them and looked at uh, their supernatants and ran a, uh, a screen to see what their angiogenic profile might be. And sure enough, both these IPS-derived fibroblasts and the ES-derived fibroblasts expressed, expressed elevated levels of many uh, of these angiogenic growth factors. And in fact, when we took these cells and seeded them onto a, uh, a fibrin bead assay, here we have beads surrounded by fibrin with endotheliales attached to them. We did these sprouting assays in the presence of either the IPS or the ES-derived. Uh, fibroblast, and we saw that they did induce uh, sprouting of these endothelial cells, suggestive of a highly angiogenic phenotype associated with these cells that were differentiated from uh, the induced pluripotent stem cells. We then further characterized the angiogenic properties of these cells and took the cells and co-cultured them together with uh, UVEX cells, with endothelial cells at different ratios. And what we found was that both of these, uh, both IPS as well as ES-derived cell lines were able to form these uh, organizing tubules in which they were able to co-localize. These cells were co-localizing together with these endothelial cells, suggesting that there may be some relationship or perhaps an, uh, a pericyte phenotype associated with some of these mesenchymal cells that have this fibroblast phenotype. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we proceed. So one of the great features of reprogramming back to IPS is that the cells undergo a wholesale epigenetic remodeling. And in fact, that is how they shut down the genes that need to be turned off when they revert from a pluripotent, re revert from an adult somatic cell back to a pluripotent cell. And it's uh, an epigenetic remodeling that occurs as you differentiate these cells and commit them to a specific lineage. So, uh, I know that there is expertise in this room, fortunately, in the area of methylation biology. In fact, uh, was Choi, is Choi? Yeah, I know Choi's away today. Yeah. It was very helpful, together with Lara, when we were planning some of these studies early on. And I'm really happy that Lara Park is now a postdoc in our lab to pursue these studies further. But the opportunity to look at patterns of methylation that change with reprogramming provides uh, some information that tells us something about not only this epigenetic remodeling, but also points us to some targets that are differentially expressed before and after reprogramming. So we performed a series of studies and a series of screens, essentially comparing the uh, input donor fibroblasts that we reprogrammed, the IPS derived from them, and the output uh, fibroblasts derived from those IPS. And we looked specifically at patterns of methylation that were present in specific promoter regions of uh, many, many genes. And as some of you know, the, uh, uh, what we're screening for are the CPG islands that are found in uh, conserved promoter regions of the genome, where we can determine that the CG base combination, which uh, can point us towards genes that are uh, regulated by methylation, whose expression is regulated by methylation during the reprogramming and after differentiation from IPS. So in principle, methylation, as you'll see, is associated with, with repression of gene expression. Demethylation is associated with expression of, gene ex uh, expression of these genes. And we compared our input, here we see the input IPS and embryonic stem cells to the output IPS and, EP and uh, human embryonic stem cell derived fibroblasts. And you can see that the heat map shows a dramatic difference 
in gene expression, pretty much where this is green, this is red. This is the parental fibroblast that should be linked closely to this profile of fibroblast. And in fact, you can see that this is very distinct from the parental cells, just looking at the methylation profile. And we actually found a lot of methylation uh, uh, at promoters following differentiation that allowed us to identify uh, what we would call differentially methylated regions that were uh, methylated during uh, the IPS state and then uh, demethylated during differentiation. And in fact, identified a couple of demethylated gene promoters following differentiation that were associated with fibroblast function, PDGF receptor beta and collagen 1A. Here's another example of the heat map that I showed you. You can see here's normal keratinocytes that are clustering on the far end by themselves. Here we see all of the parental human embryonic stem cells are different uh, IPS lines. And here are the fibroblasts that were differentiated from them, clustering very distinctly, together with the parental fibroblast line that gave rise to these induced pluripotent stem cells. So it's clear that there's a genome-wide clustering of methylation that shows similarities between the parental fibroblasts and the fibroblasts that were derived from these IPS, but the methylation patterns were very distinct in the induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, we became very interested in looking at the methylation of the PDGF receptor beta and found that in the uh, parental uh, IPS and human embryonic stem cells, methylation was high, expression was low, and with differentiation in all of our lines, we found that methylation was dramatically decreased at this promoter site and expression was elevated. But the technology that we used to do this was a methylation chip that allows us to screen for only one CPG site per promoter. So while it gives us a readout of CPG sites, whether they're methylated or unmethylated, throughout the genome, it's only characterizing one particular methylation site uh, per promoter. So what we needed to do was to go back and say, was what we were seeing that demethylation that occurred in the PDG receptor beta promoter in our IPS-derived fibroblasts, whether that was indeed the case of demethylation throughout all the multiple CPG sites in the PDGF receptor beta promoter. And what we did was a bisulfite sequencing and mapping of the, uh, all these uh, methylation sites, all the CPG sites in the PDGF receptor beta promoter in multiple clones. This has to be done with multiple clones just to verify that it's not just one particular clone of the cells that are growing out. And indeed what we found was that the parental ES and IPS were intensely methylated in the PDGF receptor beta promoter and the fibroblasts derived from them showed uh, complete loss of methylation in most of these clones, very similar to what we see in the BJ parental fibroblast. So again, these are the parental fibroblasts, reprogrammed back to an IPS, differentiated back to fibroblasts. So you can see that there's uh, clearly a strong uh, change in the methylation profile of these CPG sites that was associated with patterns of gene expression in this particular gene. So this told us that indeed we can use DNA methylation profiling to study the behavior of these uh, cells that are derived from a pluripotent stem cell source and in fact develop the signature of fibroblast-like cells that were derived from them and I'll explain to you a little later on why we're so excited about this when I tell you about the potential of leveraging these types of readouts for studying the uh, phenotypes of cells derived from a diabetic foot ulcer. The other thing that this tells us is that we can identify very specific targets using these screens that may reveal genes that are associated with an improved function after reprogramming. One of these is the PDGF receptor beta, which is known to be important for the function of mesenchymal cells, of fibroblasts, of pericytes, and that was just one of many targets that we are thinking may indeed be modified or modulated after reprogramming when you start with a cell that's originally derived from a complex disease environment. So one of the observations was that we now had 
a potential target that may be relevant for modifying and controlling tissue homeostasis and repair, and that was just one target, PDG receptor beta. But the question arises, how can we best characterize the function of this particular cell, an IPS-derived fibroblast that has all of these potential functionalities, they may not necessarily be visible in 2D plastic conventional culture systems. So I'm going to share with you a few insights into the importance of delving into the world of 3D tissue biology as a way to best understand what the behavior and function of the cells that we derive from IPS are. And to best understand this potential, we can put these cells into complex tissue environments. This, in the case I'll show you, we do that with human skin. To capture the identity of these cells in an environment that best recapitulates the way these cells behave on, in vivo. And I would suggest and challenge you to think about the opportunities that are now uh, right throughout the Tufts community to partner with other uh, engineering and bioengineers around the campus who have fantastic models for a variety of different tissue types that serve as disease models and opportunities to understand the functionality of your cells in those complex environments. So it's a, an opportunity to think about ways that you can provide complex environments to really study the behavior of your cells in ways that mean more than studying them on plastic. So the hot news flash and the take home message is that the world of uh, biology is not flat and the reason for that and the outcome of that is that flat biology in 2D cells grown on tissue culture plastic or plates coated with a variety of different uh, matrices to optimize these surfaces or fetal layers are not highly predictive of the complex behavior of tissues and organs. Those of us who work at the interface of 3D tissue biology know that when you take cells from plastic and put them in a complex environment where they have an opportunity to cross talk with other cell, other cell types, uh, interface with meaningful biological interfaces between tissue compartments, that things change dramatically. And in fact, if you think about the way we grow most of our cells on plastic, you know, what, do, what do we brag about the most when we do 2D tissue, 2, 2D tissue biology? We, talk, we brag about how many cell passages we get. Oh yeah, I expanded our cells, 14 passages, 15 passages. That's great, but you've got to remember that plastic is actually optimized for cell proliferation. Tissues actually tampen down cell proliferation and stem cell behavior does not run rampant as it does on plastic. Actually, stem cells divide very infrequently and our entire world of 2D tissue biology is to get the cells to proliferate, to throw in high serum environments, to chemically signal these cells to divide, when in reality, what we really want the cells to do is to be fairly quiescent. So how do we think about creating these complex microenvironments in which these cells can interact in a way that more closely recapitulates their in vivo environment and their in vivo behaviors, both their regulated cell proliferation as well as differentiation. Well, there are now opportunities to put these cells into scaffolds, either synthetic or native scaffolds that allow cells to develop patterns of spatial and temporal organization, allow them to create cytokine gradients and uh, condition release of some of these factors in ways that stem cells can differentiate uh, in a regulated, patterned, and organized fashion. <coughs> there are now ways to perfuse these environments with nutrients that take into consideration a lot of these cytokine gradients that are really critical for cell organization and differentiation. And there are new ways that we can think about making these microenvironments even more complex by adding in nerve cells, immune cells, and then figuring out ways that we can 
have biological readouts that will be available in real time that are non-destructive, that have incorporated sensors, and a lot of this work, and I'm collaborating with several people in biomedical engineering to do this, and then to figure out how can we get a kind of a readout, a systems-like readout from these complex 3D tissues. Uh, this is clearly on, high on the agenda and high on the radar of the NIH, Francis Collins, of uh, DARPA, of, a, of the FTA. I'm in a collaborative group working with the Wyss Institute over at Harvard with DARPA funding trying to develop 3D tissues as organs on chips. Some of you may be familiar with the organs on chips approach where we have a perfused microvascular channel that allows us to interconnect six or seven different organs or tissue types. And the goal is to use these as a predictive readout for drug testing, drug toxicity, and drug efficacy in an environment that's going to be much more predictive of what we would expect in an in vivo setting if you applied that same drug. So clearly there are tremendous opportunities to innovate, and tremendous opportunities to collaborate. And what we do is we think of our tissue engineered models as a component of tissue engineering that we call translational tissue engineering. Because as I just mentioned, we can use them now for drug screening. We can use them as a much more predictive outcome if you want to have information about the efficacy or safety of a particular cell type. And ultimately what I'm going to show you now is we can use these in our basic research and use these tissues as a functional readout of cell behavior to predict the way these cells are going to behave if we had them in an in vivo environment. So what we do in the lab is make skin. And here you see an example of this incredible stratified epithelial tissue that has a basal layer comprised of proliferating cells. So all the cell divisions happen here, connective tissue below it. And when these cells, true stem cells, divide, they give rise to other stem cells, to other uh, proliferating cells known as transit amplifying cells that are not stem cells but have a limited proliferative potential. These cells divide and divide and divide and then they get a signal to withdraw from cell cycle and then they start to migrate towards the surface of the epithelium where they undergo a well-regulated process of differentiation uh, that allows them to uh, express proteins in a strata-specific pattern and when the cells reach the surface, they undergo cell death, program cell death, and become essentially a bag of enucleated, enucleated cells that have a protective function with the outside world. So this incredible tissue that we can recreate in the lab essentially can be broken down into two vectors. One is this proliferating compartment, including stem cells and then these transit amplifying cells, and the differentiating cells above them. And in the presence of a real basement membrane, these stem cells are actually regulated in a way that their proliferation is strictly controlled, not like on plastic, and these cells in an environment where you would have mesenchymal cells in a compartment underneath it, in a stromal compartment, crosstalk with these epithelial cells. There are paracrine loops that I'll tell you about in a moment that actually regulate the behavior, proliferation, and differentiation of this tissue. So if we can capture a way to best enable these cells to find their in vivo-like niche by structuring a basement membrane, by providing them with crosstalk that allows them to develop all of the features that you'd want in vivo, we can end up with a beautiful, well-organized skin-like tissue. And those of you who have experience looking in the microscope know that this is a very well-differentiated, well-organized stratified epithelium. Here's the stromal beneath it. Here we see the fibroblast embedded into the collagen gel. And the way we do this is we take fibroblasts grown on plastic. We incorporate them into a collagen gel. This is usually bovine collagen for our engineering purposes. This contracts down. We then allow keratinocytes grown on plastic to be seeded on the surface and then grow this as a tissue and importantly grow this as a tissue at an air-liquid interface. Now why is an air-liquid air -liquid interface important? We only feed media from below. The cells on top respond to an environmental signal that says to them we need to stratify, we need to form this multi-layer tissue because we need to protect ourselves. So at an air-liquid interface in which media is only applied from below, these cells undergo complete organization, stratification, and differentiation. And we can develop 
a well-structured stratified epithelium that has both structured basement membrane, as evidenced by laminin-5 at the epithelial connective tissue interface, evidenced by basement membrane, and critically, the crosstalk, the bilateral crosstalk between fibroblasts and the epithelium, which has been well characterized, production of growth factors by the fibroblasts, stimulating the epithelial cells to produce interleukins that feed back on these fibroblasts. This doesn't happen on plastic. So this dynamic crosstalk between these cells not only recapitulates the in vivo environment, but it gives us an opportunity to take our cells, to put them into this complex environment, and really challenge them stringently to say, can you do what you're supposed to do in vivo? So what I'm going to tell you about are a couple of ways that we use these 3D skin-like tissues to characterize our cells that are derived from IPS and from human embryonic stem cells. You can see them on plastic, expressing pro-collagen, that's very nice. But when we really want to know what they can do in an in vivo-like setting, we have other ways to create these 3D tissues where the collagen can be produced and really studied in interesting ways. So again, I go back to that question. If you have a really nice mesenchymal cell growing on a plastic dish, how would you know? How would you know what it does? It could do any of these things. So a mesenchymal stem cell has the capacity to give rise to any of these cell types, but these are not going to be visible when you look at a cell with mesenchymal morphology growing on a plastic dish. So here we have our, IS, our IPS and ES-derived mesenchymal cells. How are we going to know? How are we going to test these cells? What can we learn about their behavior? So what we'll do is I'll show you we can put these cells into complex tissues as a functional readout for these IPS-derived cells. And I'll show you a couple of interesting ways that we were able to figure this out. We had our human embryonic stem cell-derived mesenchymal cells, and I showed you what those looked like a little while ago. And then we had another cell line that we got from some colleagues that were derived from human embryonic stem cells, but they were differentiated and sorted using a CD73 marker for a mesenchymal cell that had actually grown out in a mesenchymal stem cell-like media. And they found that these cells actually had a mesenchymal stem cell-like phenotype and that they could give rise to bone and cartilage. So we thought they might be a pretty good control for these cells. So indeed, what we did was take those cells as a control. We found that they did make fat and they did make bone. And interestingly, our IPS-derived mesenchymal cells or fibroblasts did not make either one of those two products. OK. So does that tell us anything? Well, it tells us what these cells are not, but it doesn't tell us what they really are. So we put these cells into this three-dimensional tissue stromal environment and ask the question, if these cells were really fibroblasts, they would support the normal development and organization of a full-blown, fully stratified skin. If they were not, if they were dedicated to a different lineage, then we would not see that. So we took fibroblasts, made our skin, these are our control fibroblasts, had IPS-derived fibroblasts that we put into this stroma with normal keratinocytes on top, with normal epithelial cells, and said, if indeed these cells are truly fibroblasts, they're going to make the growth factors that you need to make skin. And that's exactly what happened. We can see a nicely stratified epithelium, markers of differentiation, BRDU, and the basal layer, exactly as we see in our normal skin controls. But cells that were derived from embryonic stem cells that showed a fate directed towards bone, when we put them into the collagen matrix, they did not form a well-organized tissue. In fact, they did about as poorly as having no fibroblasts at all. So the idea of these tissues being a functional environment to allow us to really probe what these cells can say and when they can say it is really important for sorting out their function. In fact, we went a step further. We took these cells and characterized the supernatants that were produced in these uh, three-dimensional tissues and found that the typical crosstalk factors, KGF and HGF, were found only in tissues that had these uh, human embryonic stem cell-derived fibroblasts. These cells did not make these factors, and as uh, a matter of consequence, were not able to organize human skin. So we like to play around with the skin and see how we can manipulate it. And what we can also do is we can take these inserts, 
of our skin equivalents, and this is about two centimeters across. This is what the skin looks like. And we can actually wound them. So we can create a wound within these tissues and follow healing and re-epithelialization over time. And we actually manipulate these. We make a punch biopsy in these, transfer them. Here's the punch coming out. Transfer them to a bed of fresh uh, fibroblasts embedded in collagen, and then follow healing and epithelialization over time. So I promise you this is more complex than a scratch assay, for those of you who do scratch assays, scratch assays in 2D. But what this allows us to do is put in any cell type that we want to in our connective tissue and ask whether these cells can direct the re-epithelialization and healing, as you can see here, here are the wound edges, here's the amount of healing at 72 hours, and at 96 hours we see complete healing over the top. So again, it's a more stringent assay. We can take our embryonic stem cell derived fibroblasts. We can characterize their ability to enable healing and re-epithelialization. This is without cells. Here we can see the degree of wound closure. The levels of HGF were indeed elevated. HGF was mediating some of these healing events. And in fact, we could even knock down HGF as a target, put the cells back into these three-dimensional constructs, monitor the decrease in epithelialization. So it's a really nice three-dimensional system for mimicking human wounds that allows us to have complete degrees of freedom over how we want to manipulate the cells, knock down, add factors, whatever we would like to do. It's extremely useful. So I intimated before that we have some data suggesting that when we reprogram cells back to an induced pluripotent stem cell state and then differentiate them back into fibroblasts, we produce cells that actually increase the production of extracellular matrix. So we're really excited about that because we think this may be our way to leverage IPS-based technologies to rejuvenate or recalibrate these cells. And I'll show you a little bit of data about that. So when we take our cells, grow them on plastic, these are the parental uh, fibroblasts which were used to reprogram the IPS that were then used to differentiate these cells. Grow them on plastic, we see that the cells in the absence of ascorbic acid are making lots of pro-collagen, type 1 collagen, and in the presence of ascorbic acid are exporting this, but again, it's plastic. So there's a limitation to what you can see in terms of the ability of these cells to do something that they might do in an in vivo environment. So we developed a system that we call the 3D stromal tissue that's self-assembled into an extracellular matrix that allows us to make a tissue de novo from constituent fibroblasts. And it's done very simply. We take these fibroblasts, put them onto a polycarbonate membrane, add media, including ascorbic acid. We can wait three weeks, five weeks, 10 weeks. And we see the production of an extracellular matrix that actually mimics many of the properties, both in terms of its biochemistry and its physical properties of a granulation tissue that's known to be critical for an early repair response. So again, three-dimensional tissue, much more flexibility, and we see that our input fibroblasts, these BJ fibroblasts, that were used to reprogram back to an IPS and then differentiate into these fibroblasts, created much less extracellular matrix in this environment, suggesting that perhaps the biological potential of these IPS-derived fibroblasts was greater than the fibroblasts from which they were initially reprogrammed. And I'll tell you in a few minutes why we think that may have relevance for the wounds that we are thinking about healing. It also gave us an opportunity in looking at PDGF receptor beta as a target. We know, as I said before, that PDGF receptor beta was elevated in our iPS-derived cells. It's associated with uh, an elevation in extracellular matrix. And in fact, when we knocked down PDGF receptor beta, made our tissues again, we can see that there was a significant decrease in the thickness of self-assembled tissue. So I'm just providing that as a way for you to see that, indeed, using a three-dimensional readout, there are ways that you can glean information that you would not otherwise see on plastic. That's not a visible, obvious phenotype. So, using these two technologies, combining pluripotent stem cells with 3D tissue biology, how do we think about treating complex chronic diseases? This is, as I said before, our complex, and I do mean complex, microenvironment that we're interested in studying. And 
As you know, chronic ulcers in diabetic and elderly patients are a tremendous, tremendous burden on humans. 25 million adults diagnosed with diabetes, and treatments for treating these diabetic foot ulcers are only effective 50% of the time. Clearly, there's a tremendous challenge in correcting the complex microenvironment that's deficient in wound repair. So here's an example of normal wound repair, where you see uh, this stage of the healing process already has a well-organized granulation tissue that's composed of uh, fibroblasts, a nascent connective tissue composed mostly of type 3 collagen, uh, and uh, inflammatory cells as well as endothelial cells that are coming into this environment. The epithelial tongue is migrating, there's proliferation, and at a later stage tissue remodeling will be occurring here. However, this is not the case in a uh, chronic wound, and in fact, fibroblasts that have several important functions in normal wound healing, including being recruited into the wound environment, producing many uh, growth factors that interact with the cells in the environment, production of extracellular matrix, stimulating re-epithelialization, and eventually undergoing differentiation stimulated by TGF-beta to a highly contractile myofibroblast. All of that is critical for normal wound repair, and many of these processes are disrupted in a chronic wound environment. So our target of interest, our cellular target of interest, is the wound fibroblast. And our goal is to reprogram these cells back to an IPS state, differentiate them back to a fibroblast, and to understand some of these phenotypes that may be most relevant for the repair of chronic wounds. We are hypothesizing that the epigenetic program of these cells, when they're reverted from their disease state back to an IPS and then differentiated to a fibroblast again, will be what will allow us to recalibrate the biology of these cells. So if, for example, in a normal fibroblast, you have methylation of the somatic fibroblast at particular promoters that are important for uh, fibroblast function, you revert that back to an IPS, they undergo demethylation, those genes are expressed, and when you differentiate them back to a fibroblast, the promoter targets undergo methylation again, and those targets are shut down. In contrast, you might have a normal signature that's expressed in a somatic fibroblast, shut down and methylated in an IPS, and then differentiated, uh, re-expressed back in a normal fibroblast after differentiation. So imagine what might happen in a disease environment. So here's an example of a disease-modified signature. Ideally, in a fibroblast, you want this promoter to be methylated and shut down, as in a normal fibroblast. Here in a disease environment, because of a variety of factors controlling its behavior, this gene is aberrantly expressed, either expressed or suppressed, when it should be just the opposite. The thinking is, by reprogramming these cells back to an IPS, you can reset this epigenetic program, and then when you differentiate, differentiate these cells back to a normal fibroblast fate, they will reacquire the patterns of expression that are found in normal differentiated fibroblast, thereby reversing this disease-modified signature. And the way we think about it, I mean, this is a complex disease. It may be enough to change four or five of the important mediators of wound healing and wound repair in order to jumpstart this process. You don't have to think about changing every pattern of gene expression, but maybe just enough to get this process started. So I'll tell you in the last five minutes about what we're doing to explore this question. And we're actually harvesting cells from a broad variety of diabetic foot ulcer patients. Three categories of patients that we're sampling. Some patients that actually have diabetic foot ulcers, some patients that have uh, no ulcers but are diabetics, and some patients in which the, there is no ulcer and the patients have no diabetes. We harvest these cell lines. We have complete medical histories on these patients. This is patients that we are uh, working with Beth Israel Hospital with their division of podiatric medicine. 
We characterize these cells after growing them, making sure that they are indeed fibroblasts based on flow cytometry. And most recently, Anna Mayon in our lab has done a microarray analysis by grouping these foot ulcer fibroblasts, comparing them to the diabetic patient fibroblast from a non-ulcer, and looking at normal patient fibroblast as well. And we've seen some interesting clustering where the normal patient fibroblast, for the most part, cluster using the hierarchical clustering analysis. This is just gene expression. This is not methylation. And it allows us, with a reasonable degree of uh, confidence now, to say that these are typical and characteristic for a certain phenotype. Cells derived from the di diabetic foot ulcer environment will be the uh, cells that we hope to harvest and to repair. So if we think about what it is that we hope to repair, how can we make a cell better through reprogramming? What are the features of a fibroblast that it's deficient in in a chronic wound environment that we hope to reverse? So here they are. There's a whole bunch of targets here. Growth factor production, evading cell senescence. It's known that fibroblasts derived from diabetic foot ulcers are undergo premature senescence. And Actually, this is one of the papers that I wanted to share with the students today. It's known that you could take a fibroblast from a 100-year-old patient, revert it back to an IPS, differentiate it once again to a fibroblast, and you actually allow that cell to evade replicative senescence and to avoid having its, telom uh, its telomere shortened. What the fibroblast secretion profile would be, what fibroblast support of epithelialization is, and how we would activate angiogenesis. So we want to take cells from a diabetic environment that are actually deficient in all of these functionalities. And I won't show you the data, but ultimately the goal is to use all of our screening technologies that I just described a few moments ago, using our 3D tissue models for repair, for ECM production, for re-epithelialization, for their ability to support healing, and to use those as readouts that will allow us to compare the properties of fibroblasts before reprogramming and then after differentiation from these IPS. And the goal is to screen using this epigenetic approach to allow us to look at patterns of gene expression before and after reprogramming and associate those with changes in methylation that will allow us to predict how these cells after differentiation can be used for regenerative therapies and for repair in chronic wound environments. Here is a somewhat dated photo of many people who did the work. Kyle uh, Hewitt, my PhD student. <coughs> Ilya Shamis, also a PhD student, who recently graduated. Anna Mayon, who's done a lot of the work on the diabetic foot ulcer fibroblasts. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So I, I would say that there is a unique epigenetic profile of diabetic cells that make them particularly attractive to this strategy. And that is that it's known that diabetic cells have a metabolic memory. That after you take them out of, out of a hyperglycemic environment, they maintain patterns of gene expression that are associated with a hyperglycemic environment. And it's known that those are mediated by histone modifications, and those have been studied mostly in endothelial cells and not as much in fibroblasts, and we hope to do that. Lara will be taking that on as well. So that's reason number one. And what's interesting, when I describe this, the conceptualization of an epigenetic memory that exists between the donor population and the output population from an IPS, there's a clear opportunity 
to best take advantage of that epigenetic memory since we're going from fibroblast to IPS back to fibroblast. It's been shown that if you go from blood cell to IPS to fibroblast, there are epigenetic patterns imprinted on the output fibroblasts that may make them want to go back to their hematopoietic precursor state. So there are several advantages. One is epigenetic patterns, epigenetic memory means something when you go, from, when you go through the reprogramming loop. The second thing is, specifically in diabetes, it's an opportunity to better understand the epigenetic processes that control gene expression, both in the, pre -di in the diabetic condition before reprogramming and after. And on top of everything else, we have some really interesting early data to show that, again, getting back to your question of the diabetic foot ulcer environment specifically, it appears that diabetic foot ulcer fibroblasts are better adapted than a naive fibroblast for going back into the diabetic environment and actually being a useful productive cell. So one of the major uses of, so there is a skin-based therapy that's been devised by Organogenesis, which is a company that makes a skin equivalent that's about the size of a small pancake. They take those tissues and use them to treat diabetic foot ulcers, and actually they serve as a biological bandage. They don't take and they don't replace the defect, but they produce many of the growth factors that are required to jumpstart the healing process. But it's thought that those cells, since they come from normal donors and they're not they're naive, essentially. They're not diabetic in their initial environment, are not going to be as well, as, ad as well adapted as a cell that was initially derived from a diabetic environment. So we have several things going for us. We want to take cells from a diabetic environment that are not naive. We want to manipulate them. We want to find those targets. We want to leverage that epigenetic memory that diabetic cells have. We want to go back into a diabetic environment to best leverage this as an opportunity. So with those factors in mind, you know, clearly diabetes suggests that there's many opportunities for their use in creating a variety of other cell types. And happy to say that Sheldon and uh, Bezad in my lab have recently, as of uh, two days ago, been awarded with the Tufts Collaborates to do exactly this, to look at ways to generate RPE, retinal pigment epithelial cells from IPS. Any cell type you can think of is fair game, differentiating it, differentiating it from an IPS. Okay, great, thank you.